If you look up into the night sky on a clear night, you'll see the pale, reflected light of the moon. Now, millions of years ago, that moon was a part of our planet. But today, it doesn't really resemble it that much at all. But a little further out in the solar system. Well, maybe more than a little further out. There is a moon that is more like Earth than you might think. When I was born, back in 2000, this world was a relative mystery. But now, 20 years on, after the discoveries of the Cassini-Huygens mission, Titan is much less of a mystery than it was before, and far more like Earth than you might expect. My name is Thomas Rintoul, and this is my channel where I talk about science and university life. If you're new around here, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon. But in the meantime, this is how we know that there are lakes on Titan. So Titan is around 2% of the Earth's mass, and it orbits Saturn at about one and a half million kilometers. But this varies because Titan orbits in what we call a Keplerian orbit, an ellipse, a sort of squashed circle. All the planets and moons do, but Titan's is quite elliptical, and we'll come back to this later. Before the Cassini-Huygens mission, Titan was a world shrouded in mystery. And I do mean shrouded. Titan has a thick stratospheric haze, a haze in the second lowest layer of its atmosphere, about 100 kilometers above the surface. This blocks most light from reaching the surface, except in a few key regions, such as radio waves and a few windows in the infrared. Now, Cassini-Huygens was not the first visitor to Saturn. The Pioneer and Voyager probes both did flybys of Saturn and Titan, and observations by Voyager showed that the thermodynamic and photochemical properties of Titan's atmosphere would allow liquid hydrocarbons to condense. Now, I know those are a lot of big science words and you might not be familiar with them. First, thermodynamic. Thermodynamic means that the temperature and pressure of the atmosphere was satisfactory for these liquid hydrocarbons to condense. Now, photochemical means that these liquid hydrocarbons are there. The chemicals are available. And hydrocarbons are molecules made up of carbon and hydrogen, such as methane, ethane, butane, or propane, and you may have heard of some of those. They're, some of them we just burn. Propane and butane are used in camping stoves or barbecues. And because that it seems they could condense, it was suggested that there may be a global ocean of these hydrocarbons on Titan. An ocean full of essentially fuel. But while Cassini was being built in the 1990s, some researchers cast doubt on this idea of a global ocean. They took some radar observations of Titan and the results did not suggest this. The reflectivity was just wrong. The reflectivity they got back was more consistent with solid surfaces, not a global ocean. And this led people to get really excited, thinking that Titan could maybe have continents and oceans like Earth does. But in 1995, those hopes were dashed a bit as well. Stanley Dermott and Carl Sagan published a paper in 1995 describing how Earth's orbit was circularized by the oceans and the tides, and how if Titan had this same makeup, it would also have had its orbit circularized. Now we know that Titan doesn't have a circular orbit, it has a very elliptical orbit. So it seemed that there could be no oceans and continents like we have on Earth. So what did Cassini-Huygens find on Titan? Well, among other things, exactly what Dermot and Sagan predicted. There is no global ocean. There are no massive continents and massive oceans like we have on Earth. Instead, we find a load of small lakes, disconnected lakes, and some a few larger seas, but nothing on the scale of the Atlantic or Pacific Oceans. I said before that we have this thick stratospheric haze, so how did we see this? Titan's atmosphere, it's quite hard to see through, but it's not completely opaque. It's quite clear in the radio regime, radio waves. And that meant that radar observations were invaluable. There's also some gaps in the infrared, but we'll come on to them in a wee bit. Now, a radar is very different from a lot of the other observations you do in space. Steve Wall, a member of the Cassini radar team, described it as like a flash camera that sends its light and receives the reflection of that. This means that we didn't have to rely on radio sources external to Cassini and Titan, such as the sun. It meant we could fire as much radio waves at it as Cassini could manage. 
Now, the first evidence of these lakes came in July 2006. Radar observations of the northern latitudes of Titan revealed a series of about 75 different dark patches. And by dark, I mean that they weren't reflecting the radio light. This was the first clue that they could be lakes. But just saying it's a dark patch doesn't really help. How can we go from, yeah, this might be a lake to, yeah, th this is a lake? Well, first we want to talk about how smooth they are. Now, the first candidate for true lake status was Ontario Lacus, named for Lake Ontario in Canada. When radio waves are reflected off most places on Titan, the plains of Titan, you get a sort of messy return signal, and it tends to a histogram that you can see here. The reflection from Ontario Lacus was different. It preserved the sinusoidal nature of the radio wave, in what we call a specular reflection, like a mirror. In fact, the radio wave detection from Ontario Lacus was so strong that it overwhelmed the receiver on Cassini. To get a signal this strong, Ontario Lacus would have had to have been smoothed down to the level of one thousandth the width of a human hair. Particles couldn't be any bigger than that. For this reason, it's extremely unlikely that this could be anything but a liquid. No solid surface is going to be that smooth that's natural anyway. So, what is the liquid? I've said it could be methane. Is it? Well, we don't know. The problem is that there is a lot of methane in Titan's atmosphere, and that means that using the method we would use to detect if this lake is methane, we're gonna get the same result from the atmosphere. This is a method called spectroscopy, examining the spectrum of light we get from a given material. We use it for determining stars, compositions, the compositions of molecular clouds, and we're using it to try and determine the composition of Titan's lakes. Now, I've mentioned that there are a couple of useful windows in Titan's haze in the infrared. By windows, I mean there are little gaps in wavelength that aren't blocked. And there are a few very useful ones around the two micrometer wavelength and the five micrometer wavelength. Now these windows are extremely useful because of what we call absorption lines. Absorption lines are lines that we see in the spectrum where an atom or molecule is absorbing that light. In the regions that I've talked about, the two micrometer and five micrometer wavelengths, there are a couple of very useful absorption lines in the spectrum of ethane, the second hydrocarbon. Now, we took spectral observations of the lakes and found this spectrum. You'll see that around the two micrometer area, there is a dip. This dip corresponds almost exactly to the red ethane spectrum you see over it. And then later, at five micrometers, you see a massive dip as well. But then something odd happens. You'll see the red line recovers the ethane spectrum. It goes back to the continuum. But the data doesn't. It continues on quite low. Now, this confused researchers as well, don't worry. The reason that this happens, presumably, is due to other hydrocarbons, such as butane or propane, four and three. I don't know why I keep saying them in that order. The researchers discovered that if there are even small quantities of butane and propane in the lakes of Titan, that we would see this very behaviour. Now the data shows that ethane, propane and butane are all in these lakes, so it's not unreasonable to assume that given the quantity of methane in the atmosphere, you would find methane in these lakes as well. But because you get the same absorption lines from the atmosphere, from methane, as you would from the lakes, we're not going to be able to figure out if methane is actually there without going and seeing the lake. So that's how we know that there are lakes on Titan. But despite all this, there is so much more we don't know. Titan is not fully mapped, not to a high degree of accuracy. We've not been to a lake. The Huygens lander landed near the equator, where it's much drier. And the Cassini-Huygens mission lasted 13 years at Saturn, and it did so much more than look at some lakes. The total number of papers is currently nearing 4,000 from Cassini-Huygens data, and it's a while yet till it will all be analysed. But besides that, I hope you've enjoyed this video talking about how we know there are lakes on Titan. 
If you'd like to learn more about the Cassini Huygens mission, if you'd like me to make more videos on that, or if you'd like me to make videos on some other space probe, I'd really like to talk about Voyager actually. Please leave a like down below and any other comments and criticisms, questions in the comment section. This was actually adapted from a talk for one of my modules. It just, this is shorter than the talk was. <laughs> But in the meantime, please share this video, subscribe, hit the bell icon, and until next time, I've been Thomas Rintoul, and I'll see you in the next one.